I'm Philip Kant, I work at IHK and lead the group that is introducing formal methods into the software development methodology. And the idea of that group is to make sure that the results of the researchers who write papers and improve things about the protocols at a very abstract level and in a language that's, that's suitable for, for writing papers and conveying information between humans, and that in the process of translating that into something that is machine executable, that the computer can understand, and that has all those details that are not, not, not really relevant for the protocols at, at a high level, but are, of course, uh, needed for the, for the software to actually work, that nothing gets lost in that translation process. In the blockchain industry, IOHK is pretty unique in, in applying formal methods. It's something that you would usually do in aerospace or, or for, for clinical, for medicine products, or something where, so for systems where there's high value or, or even harm to life at stake. And in, in blockchain systems, there's, there's large value, so um, we think that it's just reasonable to, to do this here as well. Okay, so thanks, thanks for inviting me. It's nice to be in Hamburg and, and talk about the stuff that we're working on. And I'll do actually the, the introduction to Cardano and the talk about formal methods that we're applying there in one go. So the first, first half of the talk will be about, gen in general, what Cardano is about and the, the consensus protocol about it, uh, behind it. And, and then I'll go a bit into the, the methodology that we're introducing in developing software there. And um, in the formal methods group, we're already, we, we also get some assistance from, from experts, from a few consultancies, from WorldTypes and Predictable Network Solutions, and actually Tweak, whose logo I, I didn't, I forgot to put on here. So a um, few words about IOHK. We are the company that built the Cardano blockchain, and um, we're very research-focused. So in the, in the blockchain space, you have all these, you, you, you touch various, um, various disciplines you have you have cryptography you have um, game theory and you have um, economics and so we try to to collaborate with with actual researchers and and have an exchange with them and use their work put it to production give them feedback on what does work and what maybe some problems are that that occur in practice and that they that they should think about and um, that would be worthwhile to investigate we heavily invested in functional programming, so Cardano is uh, built using Haskell. And I was told that there's also some, some Haskell people here in this, in this uh, meetup, so that might be interesting. And we're also working completely distributed, so we have people in, in the US, we have people in Europe, in, in uh, Asia, and um, everybody works where, where they are. And um, yeah. So, um, what is Cardano? It's, it's a proof-of-stake blockchain, and um, I'm going to explain a bit more about uh, proof-of-work and proof-of-stake in, in a minute. And it runs the cryptocurrency called ADA. And besides running a cryptocurrency, there's also lots of interesting things that we're planning to do on our roadmap. We are going to add smart contracts to the system, and we're going to use different frameworks there. We are developing our own language called Plutus, and we also use the, the K framework and the yellow virtual machine, which will um, make it possible for people to write smart contracts in all kinds of languages that are already established. We'll also uh, introduce side chains for, for different reasons. So um, that's, that's different blockchains basically that, that run more or less independently of one another, but they can, they can share information, they can talk to each other, they can uh, transfer trust from one chain to the other. And uh, one of the ideas that, that we will use them for is scalability, because um, blockchains don't scale very well. And by basically distributing the work across multiple blockchains, you can gain some, some scalability. Another thing is that um, the smart contracts that, that you have on Ethereum and other platforms, they, they tend to, to have some exploits from time to time, where people find weaknesses. And that's just, if, if you have a system and you let people write their own code, then it's, it's easier to find, to find some exploits and you have a much larger attack surface. And the idea that we'll, um, we'll follow for Cardano is that we'll have a settlement layer, which is basically, which does all the bookkeeping. And then on top of that, we will have compute layers where the smart contracts live. And um, you have a small, attack, a small attack surface on the settlement layer because you don't have all those smart contracts there. 
and it's a much we will try to keep the settlement layer for the basic bookkeeping as simple as possible and then add smart contracts on top of that but have a clear separation between those two. And then long term uh, what, we'll also, uh, what we'll also add is a treasury because um, blockchains are all about giving away control and not having, not having a, single, a single authority that decides what, what happens but you, you, you create consensus between the users of the, of the protocol and um, the thing is as long as you have some central authority that decides what gets implemented and funds the implementation and, and everything then you haven't reached that completely and the idea behind the treasury is that some of the, some of the um, funds that go into, um, into, transaction, um, into transaction fees and block rewards that some of this is set aside into a fund and then um, people who want to extend the system and want to write additional code can make a proposal and then the stakeholders can vote on which proposal should get funded by this money in the, in the treasury. Right, so uh, let me explain to you what, what proof of stake is about. So um, uh, what, what, what do cryptocurrencies need a blockchain for? What, what's, what's the thing that you want to achieve with a, with a cryptocurrency? The, the main idea is that you have a, a currency that has no central authority, that is in the hands of the users and nobody can, can tell people that they're not allowed to use their funds anymore, nobody can freeze funds and that's the, 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 there should be no central authority that decides which transactions go into the ledger, which ones are rejected. That should all be um, decentralized and created by consensus. So decentralization and the lack of a central authority is a, is a big thing that you want in cryptocurrencies. The other thing is that also everybody should have the possibility to join. So there should be no, also nobody who could prevent anybody from saying, okay, I, I want to use this, I want, I want to join this, or I want to set up a node that, that contributes to the blockchain. There, there should be no, no barrier to entry. And um, then of course what you need to, to have a currency is a stable ledger where you can where you can put transactions in and there you also want, want two things you need to have persistence so that transactions that are entered cannot vanish later on so that nobody can just say okay I, I sent you money and then afterwards it just disappears again and the other thing is liveness that um, that when you submit a transaction to the system it should end up in the ledger after some time and um, all those requirements, they are a bit, they're, they're, not, they're not easy to fulfill at the same time because you need something that's, that's very stable and that people can trust, but at the same time you don't want anybody to decide and, and to, to, to be the source, the single source of that trust. So um, blockchains are a way of creating, creating trust without having a central authority. The, uh, the most prominent example for this is Bitcoin. And so let me just uh, show you a slide on, on how this works, on how, how trust um, is created on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so what, what people, what, what the users of Bitcoin do is they send transactions to the network. And those transactions, they are, they are signed with a private key so nobody can spend other people's money. But um, people want to make sure that transactions that they send get included and the transactions that they see there don't vanish again. And um, so when you, when you send those transactions to the system, they get grouped into what's called blocks, which are basically pages in a ledger. And then they are also ordered by putting those blocks in order. And um, each block references the block that comes before it by, by including the hash of the block. And this ordering is, is important because um, what people could try to do is that they send the same money multiple times. They try to double spend or multiple spend their money. And if you have an order between the transactions, then um, you can decide which transaction is the valid one because the one that got there first is the one that's valid and if they try to spend their money again, then they, they can't do it. So this ordering in the blockchain is important. And the way that you achieve trust is that you say, okay, we, we don't have anybody who is the authority to write those blocks, but you take turns. And then if you take turns and you assume that not, not, not the whole world is or not, not the honest, the, the majority of the, of the people conspire against you, then when you send a transaction to the ledger, then at some point it will get included because not everybody will say, okay, I, I, I don't like this guy, I will not include their transactions in the, in the ledger. 
So by, by taking turns, you can create, create a system where even if some people don't play by the rules, the effect will be that you have a stable ledger where, where transactions get included. And also, um, the way that you prevent transactions from being deleted is that you say that um, if, if somebody would, would try to, to override old, old transactions by, for example, sending a transaction where they spend a lot of money, and um, then later on deciding that they, that they didn't want to spend it after all, and they, they got something in return for that money and they want to get rid of the transaction, what they could do is to just create another block that references not the last block, but the block before that. Um, but uh, if, if you take turns, and then you also require that honest people just uh, always take the longest chain, then it gets increasingly harder to um, revert transactions if you go further down the blockchain, because you would have to compete with a chain that's already there. Of course, the problem with taking turns is we want to be permissionless. So we don't want to say, OK, you can go in, you can go in, you can go in, you, and you can't. And if you are permissionless and you don't check for identity of people, then you also can't prevent somebody for just, from just registering multiple times. And that's what's called the civil attack. So somebody who would like to, to attack this, this uh, setup, they could just register 10,000 times. And then if everybody just takes turn, they would take 10,000 uh, turns when anybody else would just take one turn. And then it would be easy for them to revert old transactions. And so the solution that, that Bitcoin uses for that is um, to, uh, to add a cost for registering. And that cost is in the form of some basically some arbitrary mathematical puzzle. So you see that, that all those blocks, they, um, they include a hash to the previous block. And <clears throat> what Bitcoin requires is if you want to write a block, you can add some, some arbitrary data to the block, some, just some string of data. And then you must do this in such a way that the hash of the block has a number of trail of, of leading zeros. And um, this is something that you can just, you can't, since the, the hash is not, is not um, reversible, you, can, you can't just compute what, what kind of nonce you have to include here, but you have to try it and try it again. So you add some data, and then you see, okay, the first digit is a one, and then you say, okay, you have to do it again. And so you have to spend a lot of, basically, of, of, um, of hashing powers, of, com of computing power, to try, add some data, compute the hash of the block. If it fits, you're lucky, you can submit it. If not, then you have to try again. And so that, that adds a cost to registering. And because of that cost, it gets, it gets um, expensive to attack the network because you would have to own more computers than, than everybody else in the system. And that's how, how Bitcoin creates trust. So um, proof of work, what does it, um, how does it work? You have basically a, a randomized leader election where you say that for every CPU that you add to the system, you get one vote. So it's a randomized, you can view this as a randomized election where the chances of being elected is proportional to the amount of CPU power that you, that you put into the system. And um, then if you, if you are lucky and you win this race, then you get to write a block and there's some, some rewards associated with that. And we prevent to have, to have old transactions being reverted by just saying that the longest chain always wins. And then as unless you have more CPUs than anybody else, then it's hard to and it's exponentially hard to, to revert old transactions. The problems with that is that this, this, um, this hashing power has a huge energy consumption. So um, the, the energy consumption of the Bitcoin network is something on the order of a small national state, and that all for just, um, for just having a transaction rate of something like, like 10 transactions per second or something like that. And so the energy consumption is huge, and it's also um, very hard to scale, scale the system to, to have something that has, la that has higher transaction rates. And also, because um, this race is basically a winner-takes-it-all race. So if, if you are lucky and solve this, this, uh, this, um, this puzzle first, then you get to create a block. But everybody else who, who was busy trying to solve that, that uh, puzzle has to go on and solving a new puzzle, because um, the next block will be different. And so in order to uh, maximize the chances of getting anything out of this race, people um, work together and form pools, and those pools lead to, to centralization again. 
And the whole, the whole thing that you, that you wanted to have in, in a cryptocurrency is that you don't have a central authority and you, you just have trust from a large collective of groups. And if they, if they group together to form a handful of mining pools, then it's, it's questionable whether you have really achieved that goal. So um, the thing that you can look for is to have some, some other scarce resource. I mean, the thing, why, why did we have this puzzle in the first place? It was to prevent people from just registering multiple times and increasing their chances of being elected. So um, the question is, can we find another scarce resource that, that we could use to basically um, decide who gets elected that is not as energy efficient and that doesn't lead to this, to this large uh, degree of centralization? And the thing is, um, we do have that resource because we have a cryptocurrency, we have a currency on top of that ledger, and that currency itself is a scarce resource. There's a limited supply of coins. And um, so what, what we can do is that we can just say we, um, we p randomly pick one coin and the owner of that coin gets to write the, new, the next block. And um, if, if we do that, then basically in order to, to have a higher chance of, of getting elected for the next block, you would have to buy more of the currency. And that's also something that gets increasingly expensive, just like buying, buying server farms. But it has the additional, um, um, the additional advantage that it's tied to the system itself. So um, if, you, if you are a large stakeholder and you bought lots of this currency, then um, you have a, a better chance of attacking the system, of subverting it, of deleting transactions from the system. But you wouldn't want to do so, because if you did that, and if people noticed that you did that, then you would devalue the currency. And you have bought a lot of that currency, so you are incentivized to be honest. Because if you play dishonestly and you are a large stakeholder, then people will lose trust in the system. And trust is ultimately what creates the value for this whole thing. So um, this, this scarce resource that, that, that basically protects us from the civil attack is actually very effective because it also incentivizes people to play honestly because people who have lots of that cryptocurrency in contrast to people who have bought lots of computers are actually um, would, would lose something if that particular currency got devalued. The problem with that um, and the reason why it, why it hasn't been uh, used so far is that um, for this election process you need some randomness. So for the, for the proof of work, you basically you have a, a random election and the randomness is basically, it's just there, it's, it's, um, it's implicit. It's just whoever wins this race is elected. But if you want to pick a random coin, then you need an explicit random number generator. You need to have some randomness and that has to be explicit. And so there, there's two things that, that you need there. You need to all agree on the same source of randomness. But then of course, um, you, if, if you had a, a central authority for that random number generator, then that authority would again control large parts of the system because the random number generator in the end is the thing that, that picks the coins and thereby picks the slot leaders and decides who can write blocks. And so you don't want a central authority to, to have control over the random number generator. And the other thing that you also don't want to have is for anybody to be able to predict the random number generator because um, this randomly picking one coin, it's basically lining up all the coins in the system and then producing a random number and then picking the nth coin. And if you could predict the random number generator, then what you could do is that you could just um, send money across the system and try to get a distribution where your coins are at this place that will get chosen. So you need, you need two things for the random number generator. You need a decentralized random number generator and one that cannot be predicted by people in advance before this election process. And that's not an easy problem. And that's, that's uh, why, why uh, proof of stake was um, often thought to be um, not as safe as proof of work. Um, now, one, one result from IOHK and the, from, from the researchers at IOHK is this Ouroboros protocol. Ouroboros is, um, is a Greek mytho mythological uh, figure. It's a snake that, that bites his own tail. And why that is the name for the protocol will become clear when I describe it a bit. And that's the first uh, proof of stake protocol that has actual proofs of security. So they, they wrote a paper and submitted it to a conference and other researchers looked at it and, and read their proofs and said, okay, this is, this is fine for publication. And um, the way that it works is that you split time into slots and each slot will have a block. And um, for each of those slots, 
one of the one of the stakeholders is randomly elected to be the leader for that slot and will have the right to create a block and for that you need you need some randomness and the way you do that is that you group those slots again into into epochs and um, before the start of an epoch all the stakeholders have to agree on some seed for the next random number generator and um, this is done in a way that basically the stakeholders themselves privately roll a dice and produce some, some randomness and uh, they, they don't reveal it immediately to, to the other parties so nobody can predict what the overall randomness will be. And then at the end th th what, what they do is that they post to the blockchain a, basically a proof that they already know what they have rolled and that they can no longer tamper with. And then um, once the stake for the next epoch is, is clear what, what that will be all the random numbers are revealed and are combined in a specifi specified way and then you have a new seed. So the seed is something that everybody has the ability to influence but nobody has the ability to predict because it's, it's, it's many random numbers that are shared and nobody can just hold back their result and, and just give the number that would have the effect of, uh, of um, influencing the random number generator in the way that they want because they everybody basically has to guarantee that they already rolled the dice and will no longer change it. Um, but, but nobody sees what the others have rolled. It's, it's like sitting at a table and rolling a dice and putting your hand over it and everybody sees that you have your hand over it and then you reveal it all at the same instant. But it's, it's a, in a distributed system so there's, there's some, um, some cryptography behind that where you basically have to prove that, that what, you, what you will tell in the end is already what you committed to in the first place. And um, th this, this protocol then is proven secure against adversaries that, has, that have less than half, per, half of the stake, which is um, basically the same as having more than half of the computing power in Bitcoin. Here is having more than half of the, of the stakes, so of, the, of the amount of ADA in, this, in the system. And uh, what they did is basically look at sequences of slots and of sequences where um, you either have an honest party uh, being the slot leader or a dishonest party and then they basically look at sequences where it will be possible to create a fork that goes back a long time and then they, they basically um, give they, they look that those kind of sequences are, are rare and are hard to randomly um, produce and um, what the, basically the, the result for, for the security is in or oh, oh, one of the, uh, the ways to present this is in form of a table where you list the adversary strengths. So for Bitcoin, this would be the, the amount of, com of computing power, the fraction of the total computing power. And for Cardano, this would be the uh, proportion of the stake that somebody owns. And then you say, how many minutes do I have to wait after a transaction enters the system in order to be 99% sure that this can no longer be reverted? And then you see that for Bitcoin, if an adversary has 10% of the hashing power, you need to wait 50 minutes to have this 90% guarantee. And for um, Ouroboros, it's uh, three to five minutes. And this distinction here is if you, um, if you um, require that the adversary only does things where nobody can see that he doesn't behave through the protocol. Because what one could do is uh, do stuff like um, publish two separate blocks for the same slot, which is against the protocol. And if you did that, everybody would just see that you're not behaving honestly. Right, so, so that's, uh, that's the, the first provably secure proof of stake protocol and it is what we have running in production in Cardano and what basically what, what we build upon, what's creating the trust for us. Um, the next step in that, there's always room for improvement, is called Ouroboros Preos. It's an extension of the protocol that um, basically deals with the question of what happens if messages are delayed because what we do in this proof of stake is that we explicitly um, discretize time and, and use time intervals, these slots, and we have a block for each slot. And um, then of course, in order for, for the chain to work, this information of, of the, the, the last block has to propagate the network before the next slot leader has its turn. Because, um, because otherwise we would get forks automatically because just the people would, would think that the slot is empty. And in, in real networks, you can have delays of messages sometimes. You have outages, you have stuff like that. And Robos Preos tries to, to extend or does extend the adversarial model to include network delays. 
and then if the network becomes uh, becomes uh, less reliable, then the adversary strength grows stronger, and you have you have less guarantees, but you still have guarantees, and you can quantify them. And that's what we're currently implementing for for the next version of Cardano. Right. So that's that was basically the the introduction part to to Cardano. The next thing is then um, how do we go from from actually from a paper that that contains all these, these proofs and those cryptographic protocols from something that looks like this, where you have text written in, in just English language and mathematical formulae into something that looks like this, which is executable by a machine and actually runs the system. And um, yeah, there, 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 there's, there's quite a lot of gap between that because the, the paper is, as I said, it's just written to, to be understood by humans and to have a discussion about it by humans. And, and it, um, it glosses over many details that you, that you don't need in order to reason about the protocol, but that you would need if you actually run the protocol on a, on a, on a distributed network of nodes. So, um, yeah, paper and implementation, as I said, they, 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 they are very different things. You have the publication that is at a very high level of abstraction, because when you talk about those cryptographic protocols, you don't want to worry about stuff like database connections or networking details or anything like that. So the thing that they, they say in the paper is they, they have a network as some abstract functionality that just gives messages from one computer to, to the rest, and, and that's it. But that's not something that you can put in code, of course. And it's something that, that is meant to be understood by humans. So it's, it's elaborate and it's, it's not as precise as a, as a programming language. There's lots of implicit conventions in the literature and, and stuff. And, and um, yeah, it, it's meant for a discussion among experts and not for just a dull interpretation by a machine. And it also has, has real mathematical proofs of, of the security guarantees that they give. And on the other hand, the code, it has to deal with all those, those low-level details um, that, that the cryptographers don't, don't want to uh, consider them, and that they also don't have to consider. But if you want to have a natural running machine, then you need to consider those at some point. It's written in, in, um, in a very formal language, so in our case it's Haskell. And um, the question is, if, if you have code, can you also somehow transfer those, those proofs that you have in the paper to, to the actual implementation. Um, and th the, the key thing that, that we're going to do is to avoid doing the thing basically in, in one, one big leap where you, where you conflate these, these things of changing the language and adding the detail and instead go in, in very small steps. Because if you, if you do small steps, then it's easier to make sure that, that each of those steps is correct. And then by induction, if each of the steps is correct, then also the whole thing is correct. So the first step in that is to just do a translation of the algorithm and the protocol into a very formal language without adding any detail at all, staying at the same level of abstraction, talking about the same things, and, but, but getting to something that is readable by a machine and where the machine can, can, can interpret it and can at, at best even understand the proofs that you have about it. And then once you have this um, precise, but still very abstract thing, you can add one detail after another. You can refine the thing, add detail, and um, basically go one step after the other, add a storage layer, add networking, add, add multiple things, do performance optimizations, everything like that. But do that in small steps, and those steps should be small enough that you can either do proofs that, that those steps do not spoil your correctness, or because proofs are very hard to do and require lots of time and we want to deliver at some point and we have some, some business needs of, of finishing in, in a finite amount of time, at least to, to basically um, test things and um, do proper reviews of those and um, have your colleagues accept that, that, this is, that this is correct. And also when, when you do those small steps, you are very explicit in where you make design decisions. Because there's, there's multiple things where when you add detail, you have a lot of freedom. Because um, if, if you're at a high level of abstraction, all these details aren't there. And if you add them, you can add them in, in multiple ways. You can, you can put an emphasis on performance. You can do some optimizations. You can, you can put an emphasis on, on, um, on readability of the code. And all these decisions, they, they are very explicit if you do small steps. 
And um, as I said along the way, if you, if you add those, those steps, you should, um, at every step, you should be able to simulate the thing or test it or, or both, or in fact, prove that the refinement doesn't, doesn't spoil anything. Now, the first step is um, translating it into a formal language. And um, the question is, what, what should that language be? And if, if you look at a blockchain, then basically what you have is lots of computers that, that talk to each other, that, that perform a distributed calculation of this, of this ledger. And there is, there is a lot of literature on that. And um, the way to formulate this um, precisely and um, formally is uh, to have process calculi. So those are languages that, be, that, that model distributed systems and they model it in terms of processes that that can be run and that can communicate via channels. So you have lots of processes, they can do some computations and they can talk to each other by sending messages over channels. And then if you have multiple processes, you can um, compose them either by running them in parallel and letting them talk to each other or you can run them one after the other. They can send and receive data. And um, what's, what's very nice about these languages is that um, the people working on this have thought about um, things like how can we um, say that two processes are similar or interchangeable? And there are notions um, like observational equivalence where you have two processes that differ, but they don't differ from the outside world. If they, they may differ in details, but if you just talk to them and look at the messages that they send, then, then they are interchangeable. And, um, you can, you can uh, talk about that. You can prove that, that, um, that different processes are exchangeable in, in this way. And you can also do stuff like equational reasoning, because if you, if you have two processes that are interchangeable, then you can, you can basically do stuff like, like manipulate formula where you have processes. And, and you, can, uh, you, you can have a compositional language where you can talk about the whole system in terms of com its components and can look at the components, prove things about them, and then put them together and that's, that's very nice and it's, it's the correct thing to, to describe these distributed processes, um, this distributed systems with. And there's lots of languages, lots of uh, formalisms there, CCS, CSP, ACP, PyCalculus, so um, lots, of, lots of papers to read and lots of, lots of tools also and, and lots of um, theorems, papers and stuff that are useful for, for working with those things. We want to eventually um, use such, such a language to describe our blockchain, but we want to use it within the programming language that, that we're using. And uh, yeah, so we, we have to add that to the, to the language. And, um, ah, sorry, one, one step back. So the, the uh, process calculus that we, that we go for is uh, called Psi calculus. And it's actually, it's a, it's a family of process calculi. So, um, the thing that you have to do there is to specify um, types for the data terms that those processes can exchange and for, for conditions and, and assertions. And then you have things like uh, a trivial process that does nothing. You have processes that can uh, send to a channel. You can have processes that read from channels. You can have cases where you pick one of several processes depending on some, 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 um, some condition and stuff like that. You have parallel composition. You can, rep you can do a process over and over again and stuff like that. And um, there's well-established theory for that and also tooling. You can have, um, there's the um, Psi Calculi Workbench, which is a formalism in, which is a, a toolbox for, for the Isabel theorem prover. And so that's, that's what, we, what we are using to formulate this um, Ouroboros Prius protocol. Um, Right, so um, we have this, this language to talk, about, um, to talk about distributed processes, but we want to embed this um, basically into, into Haskell. And that's where, where a thing called embedded domain-specific languages comes into play. And the idea is that um, you can basically write, write any program in any language, but it's easier to reason about uh, your program if the language is actually suitable to the domain. And if, if you do something in a, in a certain domain, then um, the, the idea of domain-specific languages is just to create your own languages that, that fit this domain and that make it easy to, to, um, to reason about your programs. And examples for, for, 
Languages for, for specific domains are PostScript for describing pages of, of text or graphics, regular expressions for text manipulation, SQL for databases. And the thing with embedded DSLs is that you, um, that you create the language inside another language and then you can use all the syntax, control structures and all of that of the host language and just have your, your program itself as a data term within that language. And that, that all sounds quite abstract and to, to fill this with a bit of life, there's a very, very easy example, a very simple example that's, that's uh, typically used to, to um, describe this, to, 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 to give an example. That's called Hutton's Razor, which is basically the, the, the most simple DSL that you can think of. And it's just a DSL that has two components. It has uh, integers and it has additions. And so um, maybe, uh, who's familiar with, with Haskell syntax, who's read any Haskell at all? That's OK. So um, this here is a, is, a data, um, is a data term, a data, type, uh, a data type definition. And it says that this data term called exp has two cases that it can have. It can either have a literal um, integer or it can have um, another case, an addition, which contains two expressions. So this is basically you either have numbers or you have a, a sum of two numbers. And then you can produce terms of that by just using those two constructors, add and lit. And so this would be then basically one plus two plus three. And um, so you can, you can form basically programs that represent um, just additions within that language, within that data term, within that data type. And a program would be just a term of that type. And then the next thing that you can do is to interpret this program. And you can do that in multiple ways. You could either say, OK, once I have some term like that, I want to evaluate it. And for that, you would write a function that takes a program in this language exp and produces an integer. And the way you would do that is to say, okay, if I have a literal, then it's just the value of that literal. And if I have an addition, then I evaluate both sides and add them together. And um, in that way, you could evaluate this term and would get the answer six. The nice thing about um, having such a, an embedded um, domain-specific language is that you are not tied to one specific interpretation, but you can write multiple interpretations. So another thing that you want, what, uh, might want to do is to write a function that takes such a program and outputs the string that corresponds to that program. And again, you could do that just by um, printing an individual integer or by, if you have a, an addition, you would write a parenthesis, a plus operator, and, and the two numbers. And then you could evaluate this, this term to, to the string. So, um, yeah, so, so you, can, you can write a program in that, in that language and then you, have different, you can have different evaluations depending on what you want to do and um, the idea for having that for the for the um, for the psi calculus in Haskell and for for implementing the protocol is that we implement uh, psi calculus as an emb embedded DSL in Haskell and then we write the Ouroboros prayers protocol itself in this language and then by writing different interpreters for the language we can do stuff like simulating the program by, by pretend by looking at what would happen if we would run it and getting a, a, a list of log messages, basically. Or we could export it to the syntax of a proof assistant, like Isabel or Koch, if we want to prove that we, we made a step of refinement between two versions of the, of the protocol, then we would like to prove that they are exchangeable. And for that, we can just export the programs into Isabel syntax, for example. Or what we could also do, and, and this is the end goal, is to have an interpreter that actually runs the whole thing, where we add all the details, all the, the networking, the storage layer, and so forth. And then the same program that we have, that is the basis for the simulations and for the export to the proof assistance, will be ultimately what, what is actually running on, on the nodes. And that's, that's very nice. Uh, how does this look like uh, in, in practice? So th this is probably a slide that you, you might want to gloss over if, you, if you're not familiar with Haskell. It's basically, again, a data a type where we have different constructors, one for a process that does nothing, one for creating a channel, one for consuming some input from a channel and getting a new process, one for outputting some, some data to a channel, something for logging. And then we'll write, we will um, have different interpreters that, that take a list of processes 
and then either simulate the whole thing and give us a list of log messages, or export the whole thing to a, to a proof assistant, or actually run the whole thing and have a program that's, that's running on a node. And then the actual thing will have some, something more. We'll also add channels where everybody can listen to that, and we'll allow a process on one node to, to have sub-processes that, that can only communicate to itself, and stuff like that. But, but the, the simple, the, I mean, the, the general idea is the same thing as with a simple addition language. You have one data type, you have different constructors for that data type, and each one gives you something from that language, constructing new channels, communicating over channels, stuff like that, forking a new process, all of these things. And, um, right, so um, that's, that's the, the formal language for, for basically expressing, expressing the, the, uh, the consensus algorithm, the, the protocol. Once you have that, you can build this, this uh, basic uh, tower of abstraction where you have the, formalized, the formalization of the paper at a very abstract level, and then you can add lots of details. And um, while building this tower of abstraction, we can go from the, from the top down, which you can't do with ordinary towers. Um, the first refinement that we could do is, for example, that in the paper they just uh, talk about chains, and each, each uh, node has its own chain, and they talk about their chains. But in principle, what you do is that you send around single blocks, and that's already something that, that makes the thing more complicated, more involved. So uh, talking about chains is, is easier, and it's easier to reason about, but what you'll actually need to do is to send single blocks through the network, and then add blocks to chains and, and um, stuff like that. Next thing is that you need to add persistent storage to the, to the individual nodes, you need to add networking, you can do uh, optimizations with the performance and stuff like that, and then in the end, you end up with production code. Um, right, so, so that's basically various versions of, of the same protocol having different, different levels of detail, basically, a different granularity, more, more details here as you go down. Now, if you, um, if you evolve this over time, if you do some, something with this, with this uh, protocol, for example, you could wait for an epoch and see how the system looks like, or you could send some transactions to it, or you could have different events that happen to it, then you will have two versions of, the, of this whole tower of, 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 of protocols, and they would differ in, in their state. Because they have they, they, time progresses here from, from left to right, so they have, have, um, they have had some transformations, and their state changed. And you can do that at different levels of abstraction. You can do that with just regarding the, the abstract protocol, and you can do that with the actual production code. And the nice thing, if you have this whole tower of, of basically of, of versions of the protocol at different levels of abstraction is that you can go from the production code up to the, to the, to the abstract method by just, by just abstracting stuff away, by, by hiding the details again. And that gives you a very nice setup for, for testing in that you can um, write tests where you have um, an initial state in the production code, you evolve it over time, and see what the, what the final state looks like, and then at both ends you can abstract away from, from various details and end up somewhere higher up in the tower, where stuff is, is much simpler, and you can do that on both sides, and see how would the abstract model have evolved over time, and then you make sure that basically what you end up by going from here to here is, and, then, and then to there is the same as you end up with going from here to here to there. And that is, that's a very nice test because the, the state transitions that you have here, they will be very complicated and they will involve everything in your system. They will involve the storage, the networking and, and, and all that and, all the, and possibly some optimizations. And up here it will only be, be the paper. So that's something that you, can, that you can reason about and that you can write simple simple um, stuff about. And if you, if you test that, that going from here to here is the same as going that way, then that's, that's, very, nice, um, that's a very nice testing setup. Right. Um, one, one question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say again? Yes, yes, it's, 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 this is also, so the initial step, going to the formalized language, that's basically from, from outside here. So you have here, the, you have the paper, 
and then you, you formalize the paper into this formal language. And then within that language, you can add details by just, by just um, adding refinements to your program and adding stuff that, that is kept abstract at this level and then um, yeah, adding, adding detail there. And so, so this is all within the same language and just, just having more or less detail. Does that answer the, the question? Okay, good. good. Right. Uh, so the last part of my talk is about um, modeling performance because um, what we um, um, what we what we need in this in these proof of stake protocols is is to have a good handle about the the performance of the whole system because as I said you have this this um, this this uh, slot length where you need to have blocks propagating through the whole network and so you need to have you need to have a very clear picture of how performant your your system is in order to set this, this slot length and to set other parameters that, that basically behave how difficult it is for, for the nodes to, to verify a block and to send it around. And so there, there's various parameters that you, uh, that you can tune and in order to tune them efficiently to get a good throughput in terms of transaction rate and to have the system uh, run stably, you need to know how, how well it performs. And um, wh what we did before the launch is to basically set up a, a benchmarking environment where we where we have nodes running on different continents and we, we try to put pressure on them by sending lots of transactions to them and then seeing, okay, can, can they keep up and um, how can we tune these parameters, where do we have a safety margin and so on. But um, what would really be nice if we, um, if we could have a handle not only from, from experimenting but also from theory, if we could basically get a prediction, how well should this code run? Because if you, if you do benchmarks, then you, you get some numbers and you see, okay, this is the time that it takes for a block to propagate through the network, but you don't really understand why that is the case, or neither do you understand whether that is actually good and what you should expect if the code were uh, perfect, or whether you, you have some room for improvement. So what we want to do in these, in these, um, in these um, languages is to also include a notion of performance in it and of timeliness. And then we can answer stuff from the protocol itself, like how long does it take, does it take for transactions to be recorded in the, in the system? How long does it take for a new node to join the network and get knowledge of the blockchain? And is this this critical thing that blocks propagate through the whole network? How realistic is that assumption given a certain slot length? And also what kind of resources do you need to actually run a node? And um, the, the language that we use for speaking about that is um, to look at something that's called impairment of quality or delta Q. So um, th this uh, diagram here is basically on the x-axis you have time and um, on the y-axis you have the probability that by a certain time some event will have occurred. And in, in perfect systems you would just have a, have a line that approaches one at some point if, if the if the event that you are waiting for must occur after some time, then this would reach one. But since a uh, real world system always can fail, this will not approach one, but uh, typically will, will saturate at some, at, some, at some lower level. And then the difference to the one will be your, your chance of failure if, if you wait for an arbitrary uh, amount of time. And um, so that's called what's, an, uh, that's what's called an improper cumulative distribution function. So at, at each point in time, you have some, some probability for the event having occurred by that time. And um, right. So uh, th that's something that we can model in, in Haskell, in our language. And basically how we model that is um, by having this delta Q be a function that takes the state of a random number generator and then produces a pair of either a number of seconds that it took the event to, to, uh, to occur or nothing if it didn't occur and a new state of the random number generator. And then you can express some, some simple um, delta Q expressions like an event that happens exactly after some number of seconds or something that happens immediately or never or something that happens within some, some interval of time. And you can also um, combine these, these basically these simple um, the simple uh, delta Q expression. So if you have something where you have an event that will occur after some time and then after that something will occur with a 
with a certain probability within some interval, then you can, you can add those things together and, and compose them one after the other. Or you could also um, wait for, for the first one to occur. And you can, you can model this relatively nicely. And, um, and then you can perform simulations about that. And um, just to, to give you an example, I'll, I'll show you something that, that Lars did, actually, um, uh, a simulation um, where you have a ring of nodes and you pass a message from one node all across the whole ring back to itself. And um, with, each, with each step, the message has some, some distribution for delay and some chance of failure. And then, of course, what happens is that if you just send the message once and wait for it occurring, then at each step it, it can fail. So the, the chance of failure basically will, will add up. And um, then there's different scenarios that you, can, that you can observe. You could either say, OK, I just send it and wait for it to, to, to reach the endpoint again. Or I send it, and if I notice that it didn't reach the point by some time, I resend it. Or if I, if I notice that it didn't make the first hop, I resend it immediately. And then you get this, this nice graph. You get here below that. That's basically the curve for just sending it once and hoping that it will arrive eventually. And you see that um, the, the probability for it arriving is rather low. And that's just because the, you, you multiply the chance of it arriving eventually each time you make a hop. And so you get an, you get a, an exponential decrease of, of actually um, of reaching the, 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 your goal. The, the next best thing is to just resend it after you m make sure that it didn't arrive at the, at the destination at all. And then you basically have some uh, uh, chance that it arrives on the first go. And then after you notice that it didn't uh, make it, you send it again and you get the same chance again. And you add it up. And then after some point, you, you approach nearly one. And then the, the best thing that you can do is to resend it immediately if it didn't make a single hop. And then you basically get this, this smooth curve that approaches the one uh, rather, rather fast. And um, what we can then do once we, once we have these simulations that is that we can include this into, in this domain-specific language that I showed you earlier. So um, whenever we have communications between two processes, when, you, when we send a message or we receive a message, then we can add an annotation for this delta q to the message itself or to the, to the channel. And um, then we can, when we do simulations of that, we can actually um, not only do a simulation of what will the thing do, but also about how fast will it do that and what are the chances of it failing. And that's, that's, um, that's rather nice because then we have a handle. I mean, we, we have to get some input and saying, OK, we, we think that a message from here to there takes about that amount of time and has that chance of failing. But if we then model that into our system, we will have actually, a, in our simulations, we will get numbers for the overall system, which we wouldn't have otherwise. And then when we compare that to benchmarks, we have a baseline of saying, OK, if, if we deviate from that prediction, then either our assumptions of the individual messages was wrong, or we have some deficiency in our code that we should fix. And um, these annotations, they are, um, we, we can use them when we do simulations. And we can just discard them when we do stuff like proving, proving stuff about just, just the functionality and not, not the, the chance of failure or the, the, um, the speed of the system, the performance of the system. Or also when, when actually running the system, then we don't want to add those, those delta Q things. Um, the next thing that we can do with this formalism is not only, not only can we simulate it, but we can also reason about it algebraically. So um, when you have two, two of those uh, terms in delta Q, then you can compose them together. Um, for example, if you have two processes and you run them in parallel and just wait for the first one to finish, and you, want to, uh, and you wait for the last one to finish, so you want to, the, the, the event that you wait for is that both of those events have finished then at any point here, you will say that um, both of them have finished if you are at or below both of those lines. So what you need to do is take, take the minimum of those two curves. And then you have from, from, two, from, from, basically from two events that you can um, have in your, in your delta Q, you have the combined event of waiting for both of them just by taking the minimum function of those two. And in a similar way, if you wait for just one of them and you're content if, if one of those events happen, then you take the maximum. And you can also do stuff like a parallel composition. 
a sequential composition, and that's that's basically convolution. So you you start basically having a non-zero chance of both having occurred by by adding by, by adding at, at each point uh, by 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 I mean what you have to do mathematically is convolute those two those two lines, and uh, you see that this starts basically after after adding the times that it takes both to get a non-zero probability of finishing, and then once you are here where both of them are. Uh, have the time to to um, to reach basically the maximum, then uh, then you get here saturation as well. And since we have um, since we can calculate from those individual terms how they how they behave, we can do this algebraically. We can do the the next thing, and we can um, basically embed another domain specific language for this delta q, where we have um, terms for just either something that happens exactly after n seconds for some variable that's free, or for doing sequential composition, for waiting for one of two processes, for multiple processes, for waiting for one of two processes to occur with some, with some uh, random choice, or by doing different things depending on uh, what, what uh, event happens first. And uh, with this, we can, we can uh, not only do simulations, but we can also derive basically expressions that tell us how that tell us th how the overall performance of our system is in terms of um, variables that express how individual um, how how basically the the um, irreducible components of our system behave how how long it takes a message from from here to here from one AWS center to the next and uh, with that we can we can basically um, identify where bottlenecks are. If, you, if we see that some variable has a large impact on the overall um, delta Q, then we can, we can say, okay, this is, this is what we'll have to optimize. We can, we can identify regions in the code where we actually um, should concentrate our efforts on, on optimizing. And uh, this, having both of these things, the overall simulation, which just gives you numbers right away, and then also having algebraic um, expressions, which might be difficult to, to interpret and to, to, to Get to get to to overall numbers, but but can can tell you all these these details like which part of the code is it that's actually holding me back, and that's that's very valuable. And then we can like like we did with these with these uh, simulation kind of expressions before. We can also embed those annotations for those um, uh, symbolic delta Qs into our um, process calculus, and then we can get predictions for how our system will will. Uh, um, will actually perform in terms of its individual components. Just, just to summarize, the, these cryptocurrencies, they carry large values, and so um, we think that it's, that it's proper to, to, do, to do things with, with, with a large degree of assurance. So we have, we have researchers who actually prove things about the protocols and prove that they are secure, but then we also need to make sure that those proofs don't get lost in translations. And that's because blockchains are used for cryptocurrencies where there's lots of money, there's also proposals for, for having critical infrastructure like land deeds or something like that on there. And so we, we need to have this, we, we need to have systems that are fit for purpose where, where we can go to, base, for, for instance, to an insurance and tell them, okay, this is the system we're using and you have to risk this. And these are the models that we're using. These are proofs that this is secure and, and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so, so the way that we do this is to, to make sure that we don't take too large steps by basically going from this this abstract thing in a, in a human language to this, to this very detailed thing that is um, interpretable by a machine. But we take small steps, translating the thing at the same level of abstraction and then going step by step until we have something that's actually executable and can be run in production. And um, also, because in the, especially in these proof of stake systems, you, you need to have an eye on performance because if you, if you have, um, if your performance is, is not as it should be, then you might get out of sync and you could get forks because just the next slot leader doesn't, doesn't see the, the previous block in time. So that's why it's also um, important to design the systems for performance up front. If you want to look at all this in more detail, the repository that, that we use for that is, is open on GitHub. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you all for the attention. Thank the organizers for the invitation. Thanks. <laughs>